Wow, what a, what a great day. A long, a long day, a day full of amazing speakers. Um, I don't know who's going to be more amazed if I can say what I intend to say in 15 minutes or less, me or my students. But um, I, I'm going to stick pretty, lean pretty heavily on the script um, as a way of helping me out. And uh, here we go. So several years, several years ago, I had the pleasure of a conversation with Sue Ko, an artist, activist, and a longtime hero of mine. And um, she shared with me what she believed was the single greatest value of art to an activist, those occasions when your work can get you invited up onto a stage, and when you can say, permit you to say what you most passionately want to say. And so here I am on the stage channeling Sue Ko right now. I'm here to talk about suspension of disbelief a little bit as a way of of transitioning into other subjects. Um, this concept was first put forth in the 19th century by a British poet and philosopher named Samuel Coleridge. And he suggested that if a writer could infuse a fantastic tale with human interest and a semblance of truth, the reader would, would withhold judgment concerning the implausibility of the narrative. In other words, this is a pact, a sort of a pact between the viewer, um, or the reader in his case, and, um, and or excuse me, between the author or the artist, for my purposes, and the, the reader or viewer. For those of you that are new to this concept, here's an illustration plucked from pop culture. Um, I, my ulterior motive is to incorporate Buffy the Vampire Slayer into everything I do. Um, in, in order to feel empathy for and connected with the characters in these dramas, you must temporar temporarily ignore the fact that vampires, witches, and werewolves don't really exist. Uh, except briefly this coming weekend. Um, here is a more poignant example. Uh, with respect to shopping, we seem determined to temporarily, temporarily ignore reality and accept all of the central conceits of marketing campaigns that urge us to buy with abandon. In order to engage fully and pleasurably in this, these are images of Black Friday, incidentally, we must suspend our disbelief with respect to this not to mention concerns like sweatshops, clear-cutting coal and oil depletion, et cetera. On Wednesdays in my neighborhood, sanitation trucks take our garbage away to a sprawling landfill that I never have to see. Then the city further enables my suspension of dis disbelief or our suspension of disbelief by making the trash bags from this opaque blue plastic um, we needn't ever be reminded of what's inside or confront the contents of one another's garbage. Imagine the radical difference simply switching to transparent bags would make and how we consider our consumption and waste. Uh, another example, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the um, new biodegradable bags from, for sun chips. Um, it's, it's heartening in a sense that Frito-Lay is thinking innovatively about packaging. Of course, this isn't entirely altruistic. It's motivated by market and sales. Greenwashing, as this is often cynically referred to, or accurately referred to, incites and, and exploits our suspension of disbelief. Regrettably, this package strategy has little or no positive effect upon our basic moral psychology. It does not compel us to reduce or rethink our consumption of disposable food packaging, which accounts for 25% of all solid landfill matter. So think about that when you go to those vending machines back at the Calder Art Center. Um, in, in consumer America, the relationship between images and audience is largely the, the domain of advertising culture, wherein paid professionals are complicit in our denial. On rare occasion, journalistic media publish sufficient images to unsuspend our disbelief and diminish our appetite for wasteful, destructive things. A case in point, um, we have been subjected, and we've all weighed thousands of images like this against images like these, and attempted to reconcile those. Underlying all of my work as an artist activist is the notion that art, images, and objects can induce a similar disruption. I was fortunate to spend the fall of 2009 and winter of 2010 on a year-long sabbatical to research sustainability particularly as this concept applies to our institutional practices, our social systems, and our individual behaviors, um, all of which we, all sectors which you heard from today, and the role of arts in confronting such issues. So here is a five-minute overview of my past year's work. 
Um, first, Meet Your Meat, Old Federal Building, Grand Rapids. A Critique of Factory Farming, The Disastrous Environmental Consequences of Such an Enterprise. And Our just Disjointed Relationship to Animals Raised as Food on an Industrial Scale. A, a site-specific mural situated at the Old Federal Building where over 8,000 visitors a day viewed it over the course of Art Prize 2009. My primary motive for participating in Art Prize was just this, to seize an opportunity to reach a broad audience who wouldn't ordinarily be subjected or choose to be subjected to such information. This is latex paint, low VAC, VOC remnant latex paint applied through custom stencils and vinyl text applied over the imagery. My projects were not only studio-based, but also curatorial. Working in partnership with the Urban Institute for Contemporary Arts and its Visual Arts Committee, I coordinated the international exhibition, Sedition, Prince as Activism. As the title implies, the show's 70 works by 52 artists from the US and Canada are prints, exploring themes of social and environmental justice. Topics include imperialism, fascism, war, genocide, freedom of choice, corporate corruption, massive consumption, climate change, etc. Named and Nameless, an exhibition in conjunction with Wake Up Weekend, an annu annual animal ad advocacy event hosted by Calvin College. This was a small series of images exploring the profound psychological disconnect between the love expressed in our culture toward companion animals and our cruel disregard for similar animals raised as food. As part of Wake Up Weekend, I was also included in a panel discussion. I'm a little pixelated blob in that image. Uh, the, the, the panel discussion, The Many Faces of Food Activism, an opportunity made possible, just as Sue Co had suggested, by the fact that I make images some are interested in discussing. The Land of Riches, an installation of thousands of, of discarded objects recovered from the streets of Grand Rapids, I accumulated this debris while running or bicycling over a span of 12 years. The display appeared as part of a larger product, project in the old Grand Rapids Public Museum, and I could not have asked for a more appropriate context in which to display my collection for the first time. Dispersed within each of four cases were small didactic panels, reflecting upon the meaning of these objects to me and their implications for the culture as a whole. Um, so in the, here's, for instance, uh, in the center of that page, it says uh, the average American consumes over 53 times that of a person living in China. Um, so in other words, it's our, it's our re sort of relentless demand for this stuff that renders these, these transactions so lucrative, these exports so lucrative. Another curatorial project for the Padno Student Gallery here on campus, speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves, and exercised in partnership with the Humane Society of GVSU. The images and objects revolved around a central theme of animal welfare, and the exhibition culminated in a closing reception notable for its tasty vegan confections. Untitled Printervention, an ongoing project initiated during a workshop in Davenport, Iowa last December, wherein I use a growing collection of custom-made rubber stamps to embellish the currency of anyone willing to collaborate with imagery that critiques our dependency on oil, the destructive aspects of our consumption, and the responsibility and voting power each of us wields with our money. And finally, a recently completed piece for Grand Valley's 50th anniversary faculty exhibition currently on display in the Performing Arts Center Gallery. The work is comprised of small images, hand-printed over all 256 pages of the paperback novel Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, from which the work borrows its title. Ishmael is a utopian fantasy of sorts and critiques humankind's exploitative impact on Earth through the lens of our anthropocentric master narratives with an especially keen interest in biblical mythology. My printed, my printed imagery reflects the urgent tone of the book's protagonist, a wizened, telepathic, silverback gorilla. Each of these projects has served as a tool for self-inquiry, and it was, and still is, my genuine hope in sharing them that they may also serve as catalysts for a kind of cultural self-inquiry. 
This is not always the most comfortable terrain, but I've heard it said that in risking self-awareness that at least we know we are awake. It is through such inquiry that we begin to unsuspend disbelief, raising our consciousness and inciting conversation. This discourse creates the conditions for empathy, and empathy the necessary conditions for social change. Fifteen minutes isn't a lot of time. In fact, I'm down to five minutes already, and so I must focus on unsuspending just one disbelief. This is my Suko moment, and this is sort of where I round up what Levi had to say and Michael had to say, and Graham, Graham Hill from earlier. Since we've already looked at vampires, we can look at something equally frightening and implausible. Far and away the greatest, most wildly successful, most insidious fictions demanding our collective suspension of disbelief are those concerning factory farming in America, in particular the production of our meat. Whether consciously or not, we allow images like these to mollify us. Bucolic images of agrarian life are among the greatest fictions of modern advertising. In the popular, powerful film Food, Inc., narrators Michael Pollan and Eric Schlosser briefly deconstruct the image culture of our food. The deceptive ads that feature small farms, red barns, and grazing cattle in lush green pastures. The vast majority of us choose to suspend our disbelief and accept these romantic narratives because self-awareness is objectionable, forcing us to confront the devastating convenience of our way of life. When I submitted my proposal for sabbatical in October 2008, I did not anticipate discovering that so many issues of sustainability converge upon this single aspect of our culture. The meat industry is linked to myriad eco-justice issues the university actively engages, including the conservation of our natural resources, air, soil, and water quality, the protection of human resources and worker rights, and our physical, emotional, and even spiritual well-being. These are details of Ishmael juxtaposed with facts about factory farming that inspired the imagery. Perhaps these facts aren't new to an enlightened TED audience. In fact, I rather hope they're not. I want such information to be a part of the mainstream consciousness. Meat production is an inherently inefficient, resource-intensive proposition, yielding nutrition so disproportionate to the material output as to be socially and environmentally irresponsible. Meat production on an industrial scale, as we see throughout the United States, is an obscenely cruel environmental disaster and a national health crisis. In a culture beset by gross oil dependency, water scarcity, and cancer, heart disease, and epidemic obesity, the university has an opportunity to lead the shift away from factory farming animals to sate our skewed appetite. In fact, as a sustainability initiative, the reduction or elimination of meat from Grand Valley's diet, if only for one day a week, would soon trump all other initiatives all other energy and conservation initiatives. To put it another way, our bus systems, water-efficient fixtures, and composting efforts are effectively offset by hamburgers and hot dogs in campus dining and meatballs at gallery receptions. If we agree as a community that our collective health, compassion for others, and the preservation of this planet are moral imperatives, then we must reconcile these values with the large-scale demand for sausage at breakfast and chicken on our salads each a tacit endorsement of factory farming. In other words, if we're emotionally and financially invested in our recycling, biking, and LEED-certified buildings, we should be equally invested in a salad bar that boasts no bacon bits. I've spent the past several days poring over Grand Valley's strategic plan, as well as the websites for campus dining and, sus and the sustainability, sustainable community development initiative itself and have found no indication that the university intends to reduce its meat consumption or is even advocating a veggie and grain-based diet over a meat-based one. While I find this disheartening, I do not find it surprising. What we eat is an intimate subject akin to a personal belief system. But when our personal belief systems yield destructive consequences for the earth we all share and the needless suffering of other creatures, those beliefs should be subject to harsh scrutiny and critique. We need to have this conversation as friends, as concerned citizens, and as stewards of this earth. A truly sustainable future hinges upon it. The school is getting so many things right, 
planting trees, investing in energy efficient construction, composting, coordinating public transit, buying local and organic foods, selling certified fair trade coffee and sweatshop free apparel, supporting diversity through the LGBT Resource Center, providing benefits for domestic partners. It's a long and truly impressive list that makes me proud to be affiliated with Grand Valley. And with that, I have one more thing I'd love to see added. I realize there are no real prizes for TED at GVSU, but I still have a TED wish. I've often argued that massive change is simply the aggregate of many individual changes and that each of us has agency in a cultural shift to a more sustainable, less, less cruel food practices. However, this is my appeal to those with broad institutional leverage, the power to declare campus-wide initiatives and decide menus, to consider this. Meatless Monday is compatible with the institution's vision of environmental sustainability, promotes the health and well-being of our campus community, and models compassionate leadership for our students and surrounding area. And with Oprah and Dr. Oz behind it, it's already part of the popular culture. Once we get Meatless Monday right, we can go for Tofu Tuesday, Wingless Wednesday, and now I'm just reaching, but that's what happens when I have a microphone and a high place to stand. Thank you very much.